guys, it's me, Lumi and Finistra, and today, of course, it's my turn with microphone. Um, no reason why we shouldn't be able to do a video once in a while in here. Uh, right now, we are still, of course, going through questions in life of what kind of videos effects are we going to be doing uh, in the near future. And um, the first thing I wanted to talk to you today is sort of just kind of something we were watching briefly last night on... Uh, H2 on Stargates in time travel. Um, think about this. If you could go anywhere in time, anywhere in time you want to go, any year, any any month, any day, uh, except for one problem, it's a one-way trip. In other words, you get there, you can't come back because of obvious reasons. There is no way to return because that device was not invented at the time you're there. Um, where would you go? Um, myself, I would definitely love to go back to the 19th century because there were so many new resources that we were doing in the 19th century. When I became a snow green in Compi, Finland in 1870, um, the telegraph is already in existence and the, um, telephone had yet to be created. Um, electricity was not used for lighting yet. People were still using coal gas. The captain's industry were using steam engines to power the machinery in their factories. And, of course, some areas where there was water supply, such as a waterfall and stuff, they were using water wheels to provide energy for their mills. And um, there was a lot of advances in medicine and, and uh, many other th fields. There was also studies into deep th thinkings of science, such as physics, applied physics, theoretical physics. You name it, they were doing it. It's actually kind of interesting to think about, isn't it? Um, what I liked about back when I was talking about in Compi was that you know there was a there was a, those captains of industry were seriously making serious inroads um, in improving the life of people in Helsinki area. There was a lot of new research, as I said, into a lot of new technologies uh, back then. The steam engine was king. And um, unfortunately, uh, for women at that time, there was a lot of oppressiveness. Uh, women were being often employed in the mills. This is more commonly reported in London than in other European countries, that women would be working in the mills long hours, um, running the cotton machines to make the fabric. Um, the machines would run continuously even if there's something went wrong, you did not shut the machine down. Uh, when you did, it costed you money. So it was very common, for example, for uh, children who were also working in the mills to clean up all the chad from the, um, the cotton weaving machinery that would get underneath. Remember, most of the mills had gas lighting, and some even still had candles. Um, that resulted in the courses that... Um, Cotton is combustible, and um, if you can test that with a cotton ball, you certainly would know what I'm talking about. Set fire to a cotton ball, burns pretty good, doesn't it? Well, unfortunately, um, for the that and the fact that it was hot, it was sticky in the mills, um, resulted in, of course, a lot of people um, often get caught, in, get caught up in the machine in ways that were definitely debilitating permanently, and they were to get hurt. However, um, in some of the other countries, they're a little more proactive in uh, trying to encourage worker safety. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that wasn't all countries. The other problem, too, back then was, is even though it was a wonderful time for some people, it was a miserable time for others. I know from my own personal experience, and Michelle's also done the same job in her time, uh, when she was back as a rancher's wife in, in South Dakota, was or Montana, was it South Dakota or Montana? It was Montana. Montana. Okay. 
I think it was Montana. I have to look back at the record now, but I think it was Montana. Okay. Um, you know, as well as I do, that uh, life was hard back then for, unless you were the upper crust. It definitely was hard. My husband was a rancher. I, I, I can certainly speak from experience. He, he raised, he raised, he raised, he raised cattle. Um, and, um, you know, as a housewife and as a, you know, I had to deal with everything else in the world, you know, raising Abigail and, uh, you know, dealing with everyday issues in life. So, I mean, it wasn't like I could just go ahead and, it's not as dreamy as you sometimes see in the videos and TV. Life really was hard. I mean, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder and her little books in the House in the Prairie talked about how hard it could be. It was it was frontier life. It was you got sick. I mean, if you didn't know how to treat the problem, more than likely you'd perish. Um, there was no um, guarantee. In some areas of the United States, there really wasn't much law. And um, so people really kind of um, were basically on their own. Yeah. So, meaning that basically you're, you're a country girl. I was a country girl. I'm a city girl. <laughs> I know that. Um, that's the truth I'm trying to get at is, it's like you said, there was the issue of Gee, you know, I really like to be a part of this uh, environment, um, but I wasn't sure, you know, where I was supposed to sit and and, and to. Uh, uh, I mean, there was just not, you know, it was just different time, different way of doing things. We didn't have. On our ranch, for example, uh, we also did raise, of course, dairy cattle as well. Most of your beef, though. Most of your beef, but what are you going to do with the cows, you know? I mean, they had to be milked. You had to raise the calves. You know, you couldn't just... It's not like you can go ahead and push a button and have all of a sudden the cows get raised, fed, and then bring them to the stockhouse for slaughter. It didn't work that way. <laughs> we had to do that ourselves. You killed your own animals? Husband did. I didn't. Okay. But uh, what I'm trying to get at is is that um, it was it was a tough time. And from what I know about uh, uh, the girls in the city and the families, the little poor income families in the city, it was no better because, um, you, like you mentioned, in the mills, families get hurt. Whole families would work in the mills. Yeah. Um, the whole idea was is that the, the, the in this case the, uh, the captains of industry were taking advantage of cheap labor to do their great projects. It's certainly not new. It certainly was done at the time of the ancient pharaohs in Egypt as well. Is that the pharaoh, for example, would basically recruit people to um, possibly people who were required to, to complete a community sentence or whatever to help build the pyramids or they would hire, um, sure, he'd hire the, you know, the best engineers, but uh, the actual grunts that lifted and placed the stones were certainly uh, more than likely were not very um, paid very well, even at that time. Sure, was true a lot of country, a lot of times, and a lot of people, and a lot of history. Yeah, I definitely think there was a lot of um, uh, times when people would be. Uh, Facing the exploitation. Back when you were alive, from you know when you were born, eighteen thirty-five to nineteen ten, you were at the heyday of the captain's industry in the the Victorian era. You were part of. You were in the end times. I was in the end times, but I sure didn't feel like I was in the end times. Because I had, I was thrown out by my family because I refused to take a, a planned marriage. Um, my parents did not accept me for who I was. My grandfather knew who I was and what I was. And he was on my side and supported me. But the rest of my relatives um, 
didn't really like me that much. Your name was Brigitte then. Brigitte, yep. Okay, so, of course, you have a different name now. Well, you named me Lomi, which I like the name very much. Thank you. It means light, it means light right? And fenestra means window, which means if you take the translation and flip it around to make synaptical sense, it means window of enlightenment. And you have been. You have been your enlightenment. Yep. But at that time, I'm trying to get at was is because of my quirks. Uh, my family just didn't want to deal with me. It was very common, for example, back then. We've talked about this before. Um, for people to just uh, shut people up into their attics or basements and never speak to them again. Or they would put them in the, in the asylums. Um, we still do that today, Loom, with the elderly. Yes, we do. Unfortunately, it's despicable. Um, this is a continuation from yesterday. And, uh, so we're going to continue where we left off. We were talking about, uh, the Victorian era and the way that we treated the low-income people and the lower classes. Um, so... We were talking yesterday, in the end, we were talking about what we do with how they were, asylums were becoming a way to, in the workhouses, um, and how they became used as an instrument to try to encourage um, better attitudes or feelings among the upper elite of the Victorian era. The... Um, the workhouse mentality, especially back in England, was the idea was is because property was considered to be a um, to be a sin. It was to be discouraged, you know, just like we do now. With uh, we still do it today. 1950s, we had started. Fortunately, just as of my time, the um, the captains of industry have made it almost impossible um, to just get out of poverty by regulating and over-regulating the industry and uh, life around them to make sure that everybody basically um, has a... Um, that they, they don't lose control of what they consider as the bread source, the bread money, okay? Um, back when in the 1840s, or even in the 1940s, for that matter, uh, as much, you could easily start a business um, pretty much literally on a shoestring, and you could get yourself, um, work your way up to the top if you're willing to try. Mm -hmm. That was the mentality... Um, back then in the Victorian era. Now, let's bring it back into the video here. Um, so one of the things was is that they saw poverty as, as a blight, as a, um, a, a sin against humanity, and that everybody should be striving for um, to be working and bringing in income and being self-sufficient. And in the case of uh, England, the workhouses were created um, originally to provide training, kind of like a um, vocational um, school. You know, you go into a workhouse, I mean, usually you were pretty desperate to go in because it was rough, it was tough, it was, it was not fun, it was, it was hard, and, and in some cases it was emotionally stifling. Um, but the reason was is because a pastor uh, in England had encouraged the workhouses to become this austere, unpleasant, well-hated places um, to want to encourage people to get out of the welfare system, um, which really wasn't so welfare then. It was more of, okay, here we go. You know, you got off the street. That's great. Okay, now, you got, now you're getting a little training to, so that we can put you to work somewhere. That's great. Uh, but we don't want you to stay here forever, so we're going to make your life miserable and complicated and, and, 
and just dastardly. And that was what they were doing um, in England, especially. What about Finland? Finland really didn't have workhouses as much. Um, I think it was more of, if you remember the story about um, uh, what was going on in uh, Denmark in the case of uh, Hans Christian Andersen, and he saw what was going on in his times instead of H.G. Wells. They were friends. One of the things that they both came up with was there was a lot of similarities, but there really wasn't a workhouse um, mentality so much in Finland. But there certainly was depraved poverty in the streets. There was there was jobs for women as service girls um, working in, as I besides the mills, a woman could work as a as as a servant for a family that's well to do. Um, this is very common, for example, in the case of England as well. The workhouses were where you could get training to be a servant girl, um, to be a maid or to be a cook or something like that. Um, and it was in some of the jobs, some of the girls stayed on those jobs pretty much until um, they were no longer needed by the employers. And so they would work, 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 work. The hours were long. For example, um, what we call the between the steers made from what we were watching the, the British uh, special last night was a good example of the kind of hours you'd work. You know, from 5 a.m. to uh, usually, you know, 9, 10, 12 p.m., you know, midnight. Um, you would be going up and down the stairs um, uh, doing a variety of things from... Uh, besides just, you know, washing dishes. You weren't just working in the scullery. No. It's kind of like a chambermaid, basically. Yeah. Um, the sense that you would also empty the chamber pots and that you would uh, take out the garbage and you would clean the floors and the pots and pans. And it was just a really long, exhausting day, and especially for for children in the York houses, as this BBC um, documentary explained, it was really hard work. It was heavy work, and uh, and these girls had to push on um, in in Green and Berry to because it was, I mean, you were making about about three pounds a three pounds a week, which may not seem like a lot of money, but you know back then, is it three pounds a week or is it three pounds a year? I think it was, it's a good question. I think it was three pounds a year. Um, I, I stink right it. Um, these people were putting all their work into being, um, it was a better choice of life, trust me. Um, the other choice, which would later become more exciting option, was of course um, to work in the industry. Uh, as sales clerks in the department stores that were um, becoming quite successful in uh, the later Victorian era. There was, uh, there was work as uh, sales girls um, at many department stores even here in the United States. You could sell um, products to suspecting customers, like maybe you might work in the lingerie department for and have a, a well-to-do customer coming in and buying clothes from you or you might be selling perfumes um, at the perfume counter or even um, you know working in the back of the store stocking the the displays it was certainly uh, a very different way of seeing the world um, than working as a servant girl but those jobs were hard enough um, and there was only so many so a lot of girls ended up having to choose between uh, very few options. A, you could become a worker in the mill. If you didn't lose your hands and fingers, like you said, because of the machinery, or if you didn't, you know, have uh, concerns about, you know, the long hours, the hot, fetid stink of the, the cotton mills in England, for example, the... The cramped quarters, the, I mean, the likeliness that, you know, something could go wrong in the machine and you could end up becoming part of it. Um, that was certainly not really the best choice for a lot of girls. So a lot of girls ended up getting involved in the prostitution business uh, in the red light districts, which is where the term red light district had to deal with uh, 
um, the concept is that the railroad men would hang up a, a lantern to show that this is an area where prostitutes and brothels existed. It was um, very much an undercurrent trade, especially for girls who didn't want to work the mills, especially poor girls, and they would get involved in this um, sordid affair of getting um, caught up in, in, in suitors and doing tricks for people. Um, you know as well as I do, prostitutes today certainly are doing no different than their their grandmothers and the great grandmothers who are back in the Victorian era. They're still trying to make a living. They're still trying to make a living, and uh, and it's still a dangerous job. It's still a very dangerous job. Even if it was legal, it's still dangerous because you have to go at least you don't get you know your customers have to feel happy with your performance because I mean. Except for Nevada, it was not regulated. So you could basically um, um, find yourself dealing with a very angry customer if you didn't perform to his specifications. Mm -hmm. um, now, back to the, the disabled now, the mentally ill, and the, which you and I would have almost ended up more than likely in an asylum. Yeah, we would have, um, because they're legally blind for one thing. It didn't matter if you were mentally ill or not. If they felt that you could not make it on your own, they would put you into an asylum. Um, an example of asylum is there was a subdivision in the concept of also sanitarium, which was basically um, more specifically for sanity. But unfortunately, a lot of people um, were placed into whatever they could put you. So if you, if you were well, even if you're well functioning and you didn't have any mental illness, if you had physical handicaps and, and, it, and the society didn't want to deal with it, your family would even bring you to a sanitarium and put you in there just because they felt it would be better to have you in a place where you could be supposedly provided for. It doesn't sound too comfortable to me. No, it wasn't. Sanitariums, we hear about stories about Bedlam and, and other places, were really, really nasty places. I mean, you were basically um, laboratory animals for um, the founding science of psychiatry back in the 1850s after Sigmund Freud started the field of uh, psychiatry. Um, he was one of the first ones who created the concept of um, the Except, accepting the fact that uh, mental illness is a, is a medical condition and that it could be treated by, as, it should be treated as a medical condition, as a medical malady. Um, people didn't really, uh, prior to that, did not see mental illness um, as anything more than just quirky behavior. But what was clearly obvious is people wanted the sanitariums. People wanted the asylums because then they could put people into another place so that they would actually not have to deal with the handicap and the disenfranchised and the poor. And so very well to do um, captains of industry would actually pay out huge money to build a sanitarium in their town or their city because it solved the problem of out of sight, out of mind. It's just like when we say about dumps today, garbages, you know, I'm going to throw it away. Well, there is no way. Um, but what it was is I'm going to put you behind a wall and I'm going to keep you there. So as long as I don't see you, you're away from me. Sounds stupid, but yeah, we still do today. Yes, we do. As I said, we do it to our elderly. We do it to the infirm. We still do it. We may call rest homes, we may call retirement communities, um, but the sad truth is, it really was a carryover from those days. Now, let me, I'm trying to come up with a question because my brain is like, uh, was like full of all these questions and I don't even know where to start. Um, the workhouse obviously was a, a, a system to rehabilitate people, to give them a chance to get a job. Yes, but it was designed to be a rehabilitation system in the sense it had to be the most austere and extreme. It was to make sure that people wanted to get out of there and wanted to go to work. But there was no jobs. There was jobs in the service industries for ladies. For boys, they would take, they'd go get a job working... Um, 
uh, men's jobs in the mills or would learn a trade. These workhouses gave that ability. Now, we, I read somewhere on uh, a news broadcast from MSNBC, this is back when Paul Ryan and, uh, and McCain were writing that he wanted to reintroduce the workhouse to the United States. But that made sense. Let's look at the reality of what's going on right now. Everything that history is, sit, is like you said, it occurs in cycles. It's cyclic, okay? And I didn't realize that until you actually brought that to my attention last night. Everything comes around, goes around, okay? So, I mean, the concepts of the 50s of trying to give bread to the poor and trying to help the poor to uh, feel good about themselves, empower them, um, has always failed. That's where President Johnson's 1965 war on poverty, 1964, 1965's war on poverty was supposed to do. What happened? What happened was, is the great, great experiment in poverty control resulted in basically an exploding um, welfare population, exploding food stamp population, exploding homeless population, because a lot of them didn't even have the smarts to take that money and use it for um, for the right things. But even you said last night, it's like when you got your retroactive, you blew it. But at least you used it to pay some of your back bills. Yes, I did. Okay. But a lot of them didn't even do that. It's almost like that commercial we saw one time in Debt We Trust where the banker says to Obama and says, Hey, Bob, want some money? And what does the bomb do? He sets it on fire to warm up his, uh, his little... Um, spot on the street. But basically, that's what happened is the money was just getting thrown around. Um, it wasn't working for what it was intended for. Um, education, Obama wanted to encourage education. Mm -hmm. uh, so did the Victorians. The Victorians wanted to get the welfare. They didn't believe in, oh, let's give, I mean, they did at first. Let's give the handouts to the poor. Let's give them the money to go ahead so they can get off the street. But the problem was, is a lot of them had no trades. And so basically, even if you gave them the money, they would not be able to do much with it because they didn't have a trade to uh, make a living with. So um, it would basically be throwing money, be throwing money, might as well be throwing money into, the, into a um, popular stove because that's exactly what you're doing. Um, it, was, it was not getting used to start a business because even if people did manage to start a business, they probably didn't know anything about a trade. Um, so that's where, again, the workhouse has made sense because people did get a training. Um, but, I mean, I think that if we look at the 21st century, um, it's definitely an example of where our current system of giving alms to the poor and no training has resulted in basically a whole pile of people basically just taking that money and using it for things um, that does not necessarily benefit their lives. Um, you and I have plenty of examples of that. For example, some people might go and say, well, I'm going to better my life by taking my check and I'm going to buy a nice TV or I'm going to buy a nice car or I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy, I'm going to rent a nice apartment somewhere. I don't see that person, uh, in many cases, necessarily taking that money to invest in an education. If the only education some of them are receiving is becoming um, experienced in how to deal with it getting fat and, and diseased and ill uh, in the form of, of obesity and also, of course, diabetes. So, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And by the way, for those of you who don't know this, yes, me and Lumi do argue, unfortunately. Um, you're, you're telling me that you saying is, is that people are not using the money right. Right. They're not using it correctly. Right. It, and like you just said, some of them didn't have a trade. Some of them don't have, many of them don't have the skills for trade. So what are we supposed to do here? I mean, you can't. You can't expect that all these people on welfare are going to just sit there, throw their hands in the air, and say, I quit. Unfortunately, Michelle, a lot of them have done that. They have said, I quit. 
They don't care anymore. And the problem is, as the politicians are getting fed up, as they were back then in the Victorian era, is we got all these homeless people running around the streets. We have all these people who are unemployed running around the streets. We got street urchins running around the streets and hoods and all these people doing despicable and diabolical things, and they're not getting better. They wanted to get them off the streets. They wanted to get them onto a system where they could, you know, get a life together. Put them to work in the factories. Put them to work in the workhouses. Put them to work in um, a servant's court, you know, servants for the well-to-do. That was the idea. We don't want to deal with poverty. We don't want to deal with the low income. We don't want to deal with the broke. We don't want to deal with the drunk. We don't want to deal with the disenfranchised. Their whole idea was... Shove them in a the quarter, lock the door, and just basically tell them that they don't want to help them. But they did help them. Some of the programs, such as the Waifs and Stray Societies of the of the Church of England, helped a lot of young ladies and young men to become um, quite successful at servants. Exactly. Where these young people would never have had a chance to become anything without the proper training of the workhouse provided. We don't have this anymore. We do a vocational school. Oh, give me a break. Vocational school is a great idea, but these kids couldn't even afford the tuition. Well, all right, they couldn't. And Obama is, uh, is not making it any better. All right, so uh, let's talk about, as like you said, everything that goes around comes around. Like I said before last night, what would you do? Honestly, you, you, the first thing I think is we have got to stop the bread and circuses game that we've been playing since 1964. You're kidding me. No, I'm serious. We have been giving away money to people that do not know how to properly manage the money. I mean, you're, you are an exception. You managed it. You went to college. You went to business school. You went, you trained, you studied, you learned, you worked your ass off. But a good portion of the people in our income brackets do not know how to begin to break through the glass ceiling. I'm talking especially about the handicapped. You can't even tell me. Don't be honest here. How many legally blind people do you know that are doing videos on YouTube? Uh, two? Maybe. But I don't know him personally. Okay. Two out of how many million? How many how many how many people on disability are continuing to sit there on disability, not even encouraged to put the bus foot forward and keep trying because the stipends they get are designed to keep them packed into that hole. You know what I'm talking about. They are the ones that are told that if you get a job, you lose your stipend. If you get, if you go work at McDonald's, you lose 50 cents every dollar you make on your check. Oh, and if you don't properly follow the paperwork in time, you will be paying in arrears 100% of your check until you pay us back. The system that we have in this country, in this United States right now, is a tragedy, and it doesn't work. But was it any better back then? I don't ever hear any workhouse telling somebody that you had to pay them back after they got the training. They were just happy enough to get the people out there on a job. Okay. So. Um. The silence is momentous. Oh, come on, Loam. Give me a break. You're telling me that Aries, the whole experiment of trying to give all these welfare retirement programs to the poor has failed. Over and over again, it has failed. Just like that example with a commercial about giving that homeless guy a loan and he takes that wad of money after he signs his name to the deed and sets it alight. What do you think is happening? It's the same thing. 
every single disabled person at one point or another in their lives has looked at that as free money to pay my bills. And then they continue to run up the bills. And I'm no different there. Yeah, that's right. Hello? You're no different there because you do the same thing. The difference is, is that you do know it and so that you're willing to make some changes and concessions to try to straighten out the debts. But too many don't care. They think as long as they can get a free handout, they're going to take that free handout and they'll never have to work. Look at all the extensions that unemployment has done. 99 weeks? In 99 weeks, you should have gone to school with that money and you should have worked. You should have found a part-time job and yet you can't. Tell me that those people, in some cases, were able, especially if they're older, to find a job because they weren't there for older people. Sure, a 19, 20 year old could probably find a job, say, like I said, like a service industry, like serving and working in a restaurant or as a chambermaid or in a, uh, you know, whatever. But if you're 50, 60 years old and you haven't been uh, laid off after working in a company for 20, 30 years, and you're not going to be able to easily be reemployed. But Obama tried to encourage people to go back to school to learn a new trade. The problem is, is you can learn all new trade you want, Michelle, but the truth is, is if the employers don't want to hire you because they think you're too much of a liability, they're not going to hire you. Okay. So, seems like this video has gone pear shape, hasn't it? No, it hasn't gone pear shape. It's just a sad truth. The situation is non-attainable. You're telling me that everything that we were told in my generation, your generation, which one? You're just as much of a Victorian as I am. Uh, yeah, but you're talking more about Generation X? Generation X wants to work. You know that. But the system keeps putting boundaries and blocks in their way. At least back in the Victorian area, you wanted a job. You got one. Even if it was one of pretty low respect. I mean, come on. There were guys out there who were making money um, as exterminators and collecting rats. There were guys out there who would, would be out there sh uh, cleaning out the sewage systems of Victorian homes. There were guys and gals out there working on the uh, streets as musicians and artisans. To some extent, even though they were poor, were able to at least draw a picture and paint. Sometimes they were good, sometimes they stunk. But the point was is they were able to do it. But the opportunity was more there then than it is now. You can't even do anything today without oh, like regulations and fees. You're lucky you're not, you and I still have the opportunity with YouTube to do these videos. One day, these days are going to come when the MPAA and the RIAA is going to want to cut of every single video done. And they're going to demand that every single YouTuber be licensed. That would be the, that would be the death knell of the YouTube. That would be the death knell of YouTube. Because, unfortunately, they are wanting to make money. Anytime you can manage to start a business, I don't care where it was, if it was a shoe shiner or if it was trying to do YouTube videos, if they could regulate it to the point where you can't do it, they will do it every time. And it doesn't matter if you are, um, how good you are. Let's put it this way, Michelle. How much money do you get paid per, per ad? A tenth of a penny? A tenth of a penny? So you mean to tell me, if you're going to try to live completely off of AdSense, you're only going to get paid a tenth of a penny per ad? So that video would have to be shown a hundred times and a hundred clicks on it to make a dollar? How do you like that, Michelle? They have basically done the same thing to YouTube point where it makes a video work almost unattainable to make a living on it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with you.
So when you say that things are cyclic, you're right. They are cyclic. And it, it's it's sad, but it's true. The the current generation of nineteen of two thousand fourteen is no better than the generation of eighteen seventy. It really isn't. You really think about it. It goes around in circles. So where are we gonna get gas next? Oh come on, let's be serious here. Every single thing that is happening in history is going in cycles, like you said. And so did the Mayans knew this. In the long count calendar and all the other calendars, they saw cycles in everything. It's still happening to this day. There are cycles in everything. So if somebody decided to bring back the workhouse, I don't know how I would really feel about it. Did you ever go to one? No. I was just a, I was just worked in a, worked an inn. That was all I did. I just washed dishes and cleaned floors and pots. Okay, so basically, I did the same job a couple of years ago. Yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. It's a job that's hot, it's dirty, and it's not fun. No, it's not. But I mean, what I'm trying to tell you is, is everything has a cycle. But the welfare arms for the poor systems that this country has established, as well as many other countries have established, have failed. Because if you don't have the other component in there of education, freely available education, even the public schools, why did we stop home ec in most schools? Why do most schools not have home economics classes anymore? Why do many schools not have industrial arts classes? Because it costs too much money. And now, so many children today don't even know how to use a stove. And don't know how to uh, do much more than maybe put a packet of food ramen into a microwave. If even that much. How many kids today know how to fix clothes? How many kids today know how to properly clean a house? Not many. That's right. We have done this world a grave disservice by the actions of all of our uh, regulation and overregulation. But the captain's industry back in the Victorian area certainly were not afraid of that, were they? Hell no, they loved it. You're going to take my train. You're going to use my coal. You're going to use my gas. You're going to eat my food, even if it's loaded with artificial toxins and ingredients. You saw what there's shortage about the, some of the most dangerous actions of food in the, in the 1880s. Of the adulteration of bread by using of alum and, and, um, and chalk. Yeah. And the whole fact was, is they were doing that because it's just like today. How many things in our food today are we eating that are really dangerous for you? High fructose corn syrup, anybody? Um, aspartame? Sucralose, which isn't really that bad, but it's not that good, but you know what I'm saying? Sucrose, high fructose corn syrup is lethal, okay? It's what our bodies, it's sure, and when it's in an apple, it's good, but when it's in uh, its free state, it's lethal. I know. It causes obesity. It causes our body to get fatter. Low calorie foods such as potato chips with artificial flavors, additives, colors. It's the same bullshit as it was back in the Victorian era. We except now the only thing is they're required to put the ingredients on the bag. But how many know what those things are? Not me. I don't know what half the shit is. Well, they know what I'm saying. And how many people really care to know about if something has artificial red, number five? How many care to know if, if their thing contains things like monosodium glutinate or whatever that is? What is monosodium glutinate? What is BHT? What is BHA? People don't know. It's all magic ingredients to them, right? Um, the point I'm trying to say is, yes, we are going in circles. And yes... What was going on in the Victorian era and food is going on today. And unfortunately, what's going on today is also is happening then. 
Except then, some of the people were smart enough to realize that you got to provide a training for these people to get off the welfare rolls. They can't keep giving them free money. You've got to be able to provide a way for them to learn a skill and get off the dole. And, of course, they need a job to go to. Back then in the Victorian era, a lot of people worked in the service industry. They still do today, don't they? Restaurants, cashiers and um, stores, service industries such as salesmen, saleswomen, um, customer service representatives, telemarketers. You got my point. I get the point. And the sad truth is, Michelle, is like today's kids are coming out of a lot of schools and they have no training and doing mediocre jobs. I mean, talk about the example, the entitled Generation Y. Generation Y says, oh, I don't have to do that job. It's beneath me because I trained to become a CEO and a, and a major corporate manager for business. Yet, I can't answer the phone and do customer service. Or I can't at least maybe, you know, copy a letter for my boss. Or I can't make a pot of coffee on occasion. What kind of bullshit's that? It's, that's exactly what was going on. Of course it was. Back in the Victorian era, you were expected to start at the bottom and work your way up. Not expected, oh, once you got out of college and you got your, your bachelor's and master's. And all of a sudden, you are now qualified to become a, a CEO or COO of some major corporation somewhere. Or be a member of the board. You know, that's what I'm trying to get at. These kids don't want to do the things that have to be done. The menial jobs that still be, get done, need to get done everyday life, such as fixing the streets, cleaning out the cesspits, emptying the garbage, everyday things that have to be done. These kids say, oh, that's below me. They're just like the captains of industry. Oh, that's below me. I got a servant for that. And they did. They had servants for it. Yes, they did. It's not amazing. The gilded class did not have to deal with even their own shit. Literally. You know, they use a chamber pot, cover it up. You know, the, between the steers meat comes up, picks it up, dumps it into the into the toilet and, and rinses it out often without any proper sanitary apparatus such as gloves. And then she would have to bring it back up to the room again. And she had to do that every day, not just once or twice a day, every hour on the hour. She would have to make sure that that chamber pot was empty. Pretty disgusting. Yes, it was. But like I said, today's kids don't even want to take care of even making sure to wipe a table down. You worked at a couple of restaurants with the young kids working there. Well, they would leave the mess behind from the customer. They wouldn't even wipe the table. And then you ask him nicely, why aren't you wiping the table? Oh, that's beneath me. Yeah, that's true. So, unfortunately, the sad truth is we still need the grunts to do the daily chores because they are still essential. But everybody wants to go for the high and a hog, top of the line degree, cum laude, all this stuff, but they can't even realize that there's jobs in the lower trenches. If you're willing to take it. It's just like Micro says on dirty jobs. There are dirty jobs everywhere. Yes, they are. Yeah, they are. They're out there. They're out there. And this in in fact there's people who need people to do those dirty jobs. What going on in the, I mean, they're not glamorous. Um employers are not sure what the hell to market the jobs. They try to come up with fancy you know, titles and all this, but they're not really that exciting. I mean, uh, public works, sanitation engineer, you know what that is, right? You clean the city drains, you clean out all the, you know, the poop and the poo and, and the urine clogs that get into the system because the pipes sack. Um, you clean the storm drains. But these are jobs that have to be done. Or maybe you work for the, as a lineman for the electric company and you have to replace or repair wires that are corroded or broken. Or even your lineman as the phone company. These are jobs that have to be done. And a lot of times these people are saying, I can't find people who are trained in these fields. 
Because everybody wants to be a manager, but nobody wants to be a lineman. So what was the solution back then? The workhouse was the solution that gave the everyday person a chance to start out and to maintain the society and keep things working. But unfortunately, in some cases, um, for the handicapped, you, you're still are screwed. Okay, well, let's talk about that. The handicapped. I mean, we know that today, 21st century, the handicapped can do work. We know that. Yes, they can. But they have to get over that glass ceiling. Now, you, of course, you have already succeeded. You smashed through that ceiling. Because look what you do. You're legally blind. You're partially deaf. You have Asperger's. And you have smashed through that ceiling. You run a video channel. You maintain um, the North American Snow Queen. You are um, an active member of society. You are communicating with people. That's something a lot of the handicapped have not quite achieved yet. Do, do I support the concept of the original Victorian era having handicaps going, I'm so poor, I'm so... No, I do not. I Do I encourage... I'd like to see them try more. But with the regulation and the overregulation of society around us, that's not going to happen. People are not going to be giving the handicapped a fair shake. Yeah, well... So, we got to keep working on We have to keep working on trying to... Try to give equality to all people. And, um, and that's, that's the truth. Anyway, by the way, guys, let's be honest here. Michelle and I do argue. I don't know why some people think we don't. We do. And sometimes our arguments can be very, very powerful. I just don't see eye to eye with Michelle on everything, especially in the way on the welfare system is going. Um, we both do agree on a couple points, but we also agree that there are things that need to be changed. And I would love to hear from you. And by the way, Michelle, yes, gas is coming back. People are be considering re-exploring the use of gas for lighting and at least for architectural lighting as well as, of course, more gas appliances because there's a huge glut of natural gas available. Um, so yes, gas is making the comeback, at least in some extent. Okay. But anyway, back to the main point. I want to hear from you. I know you guys have opinions. Everybody does. Let's hear what you got to say. So please don't forget to like or dislike. If you like or dislike, I want to know why. Comment. It's in the subscribe comment area below. If you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe to the channel so you can always be kept up to date. Please share with your friends and enemies. And um, we would love to share more of our viewpoints and in, in, in personality with you. And uh, this was a two-part video. We had to do this in two different days. Um, so this is part two. We're going to uh, put this together and get this up as fast as we can. And we hope that this will encourage discussion. I really want to hear from you. Okay? So for now... Don't forget to keep an eye on the world and keep an eye on the news because things are happening so damn fast out there that I can't even keep up. And neither can Michelle. No. Okay? Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye, guys.